Thank you for joining us today. I want to welcome everyone to the October installment of the STS 2021 webinar series. This webinar series runs every month and features presentations and panel discussions on a variety of topics relevant and important to CT surgeons and the world of CT surgery. The topic for this month is transforming pediatric and congenital heart surgery, practice and education. Please note this webinar is being recorded and will be available tomorrow morning on the STS website, STS YouTube channel, and as part of the STS Hot Topics podcast. At this time, I am pleased to welcome our moderator for the session, Dr. Jeffrey Jacobs, Professor of Surgery and Pediatrics at the University of Florida. Dr. Jacobs, welcome. Let me turn it over to you. Well, good evening, everybody. It's, it's a pleasure to uh, have the opportunity to host this webinar with several colleagues entitled Transforming Pediatric and Congenital Heart Surgery Practice and Education. I'm honored to be able to share this webinar with Jake Jacquis, Jim Tweddle, Carl Backer, Jenna Romano, John Meyer, and Earl Austin. And what we hope to do over the course of the next hour is to discuss strategies for improving pediatric and congenital heart surgery education and to utilize the Society of Thoracic Surgeons electronic textbook as a platform to demonstrate these strategies. This slide shows the front page of the Society of Thoracic Surgeons electronic book, the STS ebook. And this ebook is available uh, over the web through laptop computers, desktop computers, and through a fantastic iPhone app. When one goes to the home site, we can see that under the table of contents, there's a general thoracic section that includes esophageal and lung surgery. There's an adult cardiac section and there's a pediatric and congenital cardiac section. And if we look at this red arrow pointing to the pediatric and congenital cardiac section and click on that part of the ebook, we then see the table of contents for the congenital section of the STS ebook. And this STS congenital cardiac section or pediatric and congenital cardiac section is divided into three parts. And we're gonna focus this presentation a little bit on each of these three parts. There's a section on principles of pediatric and congenital cardiac care, a section on pediatric and congenital cardiac operations, and a section on professionalism in pediatric and congenital cardiac care. Prior to going into these three sections, I just wanted to show this feature on the top, which shows the overall table of contents. And if we click here, we can see first the section, uh, the section titled Principles of Pediatric and Congenital Cardiac Care and the 15 chapters that are in that section. After that, we see a section that's entitled Pediatric and Congenital Cardiac Operations, which makes up the bulk of the textbook. And then finally, at the end, there's four chapters entitled Professionalism in Pediatric and Congenital Cardiac Care. And during the course of this webinar, we're going to feature each of these three sections. So let's start working our way through these three sections. First, we're going to go to the section titled Principles of Pediatric and Congenital Cardiac Care. And for this section, I'm going to welcome and share the platform with Jake Jacquis and Jim Tweddle. As they're coming on the screen, I'll briefly introduce uh, Jake and Jim. Um, first of all, Jake Jacquis is the Division Director of Pediatric and Congenital Cardiothoracic Surgery and Co-Director of the Heart Center at Children's Health at UT Southwestern in Dallas. He's also a professor of pediatric cardiothoracic surgery in the Department of Cardiovascular and Thoracic Surgery and a professor of pediatrics at UT Southwestern Medical Center. And Jake will be presenting this section and Jim Tweddle will be asking Jake some questions about this section. Jim is the Institute, Institute Director of Pediatric Cardiothoracic Surgery at Cincinnati Children's Hospital and Medical Center. He's the Executive Co-Director of the Heart Institute and Director of Cardiothoracic Surgery at the Heart Institute at Cincinnati Children's Hospital and Medical Center. And he's a professor in the University of Cincinnati Department of Surgery. Uh, Jim is also on the STS Board of Directors and a Congenital Heart Surgeon Society and, and our current Congenital Heart Surgeon Society president. So with those introductions, I will turn it over to Jake and Jim, and they will share information about the first section of the congenital section of the STS ebook, Principles of Pediatric and Congenital Cardiac Care. Jake. Thank you, 
Uh, thanks very much, Jeff. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to participate in, in, in tonight's uh, events and also the uh, ebook. So uh, this is uh, entitled Transforming Education. And I think this, uh, this ebook is, is that. And so if we think about the people who might be coming here to get educated, um, one of the things that I'd say is that it's always best to start with the fundamentals. And in the next few slides, I've picked out some of the chapters that somebody who's uh, delving into congenital heart surgery for the first time might find the most useful, not that they're not all great, but sort of most fundamentally starting with the anatomy. And so I, this is a Francis piece from the chapter uh, by Dr. Uh, Professor Anderson and Diane Spicer, which really looks at the anatomy that's relevant. So someone who comes to congenital heart surgery having had preliminary training in another area uh, would be well served by spending some time with this chapter. And as I read through this, I learned many things and wished I had read it before. So I think that's a recurring theme for me as, as, I've, as I've interacted with this book. So definitely worth, uh, worth starting here uh, if you're uncertain about where to begin. Um, another really excellent chapter, uh, which uh, John Meyer, who you'll hear from later on contributed, uh, is about basic hemodynamics. And the hemodynamics in congenital heart surgery are uh, stunningly different than in, in adult heart surgery. Um, and John, uh, in a very elegant way, without making the text too dense, reminds us of why we had to study physics. And I've uh, put some of these, uh, some of the uh, formulae which are in the chapter. Uh, each one of these is very important to a practicing congenital heart surgery. And I can remember sitting in undergraduate classes thinking, why in the hell am I having to pay attention to this? And John, John reminds us. Um, another uh, chapter, next slide, is why we studied physiology in medical school. And this is from an excellent chapter written by uh, uh, Jenna, whom you'll also hear from later on in her, in her colleagues at the University of Michigan. And this is really applied physiology. Uh, and I particularly chose on the right-hand side here to emphasize uh, special considerations in single ventricle anatomy. Those of us who have not hung around the congenital heart center um, will be somewhat surprised to learn that it's not necessary to have two ventricles to be alive. But if you only have the one, uh, there are some differences that are very important. And this chapter, among others in the book, really uh, describes that very nicely. Um, another uh, sort of constant theme in, in the ebook aspects that relate to congenital heart surgery is that children are not small adults. And one of the areas that that difference is very important uh, is, is how outlined uh, in this chapter, which is written by uh, uh, Eric Fines, Damien Lapar, and, and Jorge uh, uh, Salazar, uh, and looks at um, myocardial protection. And myocardial protection is obviously something of great interest to cardiac surgeons, regardless of whom they're operating on, but it's very different in children. Uh, and this chapter uh, outlines uh, some, of those, some of those features and differences. And then finally, uh, and certainly not exhaustively, uh, it's worth remembering that although the heart is the most important organ in the body, uh, it, it, it has a duty to provide uh, for the other organs in the body and perhaps the second most important organ in the body besides behind the heart is the brain. And so in congenital heart surgery, we have to spend a lot of time as adult heart surgeons do thinking about uh, the brain and the vulnerabilities that we deal with are slightly different and the risk factors that, that, uh, that our, our uh, patients face are different. But this is an excellent series of chapters. And if you're wanting to dive in, dip your toes in this book, these are five good, good places to start, but the whole section is rich with information. That's, that's sort of my take on, on that section. So I don't know, Jim, if you think about a different focus of people to look at this or what you think about those chapters. Well, that was, that was uh, terrific, uh, Jake. That was an, an excellent uh, uh, summary of the foundation of the book. I was trying to uh, figure out exactly how to approach this, um, whether this was uh, my opportunity to be uh, Zach Galifianakis in between two films, or, <laughs> or, or perhaps I could uh, uh, resurrect uh, Ali G uh, and uh, uh, do an interview uh, reminiscent. Well, Certainly, Zach Galifianakis would be, uh, uh, in terms of physiognomy, perhaps more similar than <laughs> than, than Sasha Baron Cohen. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> Two good choices uh, there. Uh, but I would like to. So you have um, uh, you've been in academic programs uh, your entire career. Uh, the University of Miami, Medical College of Wisconsin, uh, Arkansas. Duke and now uh, UT Southwestern and 
and in leadership roles in most of those programs. And, and in that uh, uh, capacity, you were in charge of the resident education uh, during, uh, for, for congenital heart surgery. And, you know, the residents are always uh, asking, you know, what's the, what's the best book? And, and um, so my question is two parts, really. Um, one, uh, what is the best kind of textbook for congenital heart surgery? And is this that, uh, is this that book? Uh, well, I think that sort of depends on how you learn. Everybody learns things in different ways. But I would say that um, for, for many people, uh, as a point of entry, certainly uh, the, uh, the, the material in this is, is well written by experts in the field um, with an eye towards people who may be not so expert initially. So I think this is um, a combination of really superb uh, uh, and well, well, well curated uh, text. But frankly, most of us that are surgical are visual learners. And I think the STS has, has made a great choice in its, in its selection of, of uh, companion illustrators. So when I have read through the chapters that we'll hear more about in a second from Dr. Dr. Backer and Dr. Romano, I've been struck by how sort of intuitive and, and, and well presented the, uh, the, the images are. I mean, we, we use our hands to do things that we see with our eyes and pictures are very helpful. So I'm kind of a picture book guy to get back to it. And then this is a picture book with great, great supporting text. Thanks. Are there, you uh, were one of the editors for this uh, textbook. Are there chapters that you think thought uh, really stood out or explained things better than you had uh, uh, read them explained before? Well, I, the answer to that is yes, there are. And I, I don't want to insult anybody by leaving them off a list because there's a long list of people here. I'll, I'll simply say just to begin with that, that when I read through uh, uh, the, uh, the chapter by, by uh, Diane Spicer and Robert Anderson, uh, I learned how to think about atrial appendages again. Uh, m many people on the call may not have seen the movie Best in Show, but there's a character in there who's called Loopy who has two left feet. Um, and the first time somebody told me about left atrial or right atrial isomerism where somebody was bilaterally right-handed or left-handed, I wondered if I'd wandered into some parallel universe. And, and uh, Spicer and Anderson really outline that outline that in a way that is accessible to even the biggest chowderhead and i that's sort of nominating myself for that position but no i don't think there's any one chapter that's better than any others but but they're all great yeah that was the uh, the theology reference i was thinking of when it was confusing <laughs> hamas and hummus so I could, <laughs> could, uh, bring the atrial uh, isomerism issue up um, do you think the fact that uh, the, the, the book can be updated on sort of a, um, uh, an ongoing basis is a real advantage as opposed to other uh, textbooks that are sort of uh, uh, yeah. almost, uh, a year behind when they actually show up on the shelf? Yeah, I, I think that's a that's a, that's an incredible advantage. A lot of textbook publishers have tried to get to that point, but I think of the textbooks that I'm aware of and, and make use of, I think this is the one that probably, at least so far, handles that the best. And I I, I think it's a it's a, a testimony to the leadership that that conceived this project. So yeah, I think that's a huge advantage. Things change. I don't know how many times I in the old days before we had the interweb. I do an operation and then the next day JTCVS would arrive in my mailbox and I'd open up to find the article that I wish I had read the night before. And I think this at least potentially gives me a, a way to avoid that uh, regret. For the, for the resident who's, you know, trying to prepare for a case in the last minute, it seems like the, uh, the iPhone application, uh, um, just even the laptop application would, would, uh, That'd be particularly helpful. <clears throat> have you um, have you uh, uh, persuaded any of your residents to start using this? Um, I, well, I've, I've attempted to, and I, I you know I don't know what's going on in the bathroom, but it's weird to see a guy take his uh, iPad into the bathroom. I, I'm, I'm going to hope that this is what they were reading, but I don't want to get too far afield here with commentary, lest Dr. Jacobs has to pull the pull the hook. 
That's right. I will tell you that I certainly have uh, made last minute use of this. You never be too prepared. Well, that's for sure. Yeah, well, that, that uh, uh, I, I just the, the, these beginning chapters, which really lay the foundation are, are, are remarkable. I, the anatomy, uh, I mean, I, you know, in order to relate to our cardiology colleagues, especially the imaging colleagues, um, we really just have to make certain we have that common language and that we all understand what we're talking about when we talk about different uh, uh, anatomy. And I think this uh, the, the, the chapter by Anderson and Spicer is absolutely spectacular. Um, and then uh, the, the physiology and, and um, uh, hemodynamics, again, uh, really essential if, you, uh, if you're going to be uh, conversing with uh, with your cardiology colleagues um, and uh, and and I think this this section of the book really lays all of that out incredibly well and uh, uh, builds the foundation I'm, uh, it's a kind of textbook that I think has uh, has uh, uh, resonance or should have resonance with pediatric cardio uh, cardiology colleagues I think one of the frustrations that, that I've had in my career is is uh, an echocardi echocardiographer will show a two-dimensional image of a structure that is fundamentally three-dimensional and expect that I can see what he or she can see. And it's, there's, there's a joke, a famous line about the difference about the English and the Americans who are two, two, two nations separated by a common language. And I think that it, pediatric cardiologists and pediatric cardiac surgeons sometimes feel that way. We, we cannot always see with our looped eyes, what they can see with the, uh, the pixels and so forth. And I think a, a pediatric cardiology trainee would be, would be very well served by this book, um, just to understand how we think about things and see things. Well, um, thank you very much, Jim and Jake, for taking us through the very first section of the book. And I really agree with everything that you guys had to say about this topic. We'll now move on to a discussion of the middle of the textbook where the bulk of the chapters are, the section entitled Pediatric and Congenital Cardiac Operations. And for this section, uh, we have uh, our initial presentation being made by Carl Backer. Uh, Carl is the chief of the section of pediatric cardiothoracic surgery at the University of Kentucky Healthcare and Kentucky Children's Hospital. And Carl is also a past president of the Congenital Heart Surgeon Society. Carl will present this section, and then uh, Jennifer Romano will have a dialogue with Carl about this section. Jenna is an associate professor of pediatrics and surgery at the University of Michigan in the Department of Cardiac Surgery, and she is also the secretary treasurer elect of the Congenital Heart Surgeon Society, as well as a member of the Society of Thoracic Surgeons Board of Trustees. And with those introductions, I will now turn the platform over to Carl Backer. Well, thanks very much, Jeff. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I just want to start by saying that it's been a real privilege for me to be part of this uh, project. Um, from a historical perspective, uh, I think John Meyer was the one that started this many years ago. <clears throat> and uh, like many uh, books that have been written, uh, it took some time before it really moved along. And then uh, about a year ago, uh, Jeff Jacobs, who's sitting next to me there virtually, uh, became the uh, <clears throat> main editor and has really uh, shepherded us along. And we've had monthly Zoom calls, all of the editors, uh, for the past year. And it's uh, really fantastic to see this book come to fruition. Uh, the other thing you don't see um, on the uh, index of the chapters is the uh, authors of these chapters who are all amazing experts, the collection of uh, people that were asked to and responded to uh, saying that they would write these chapters is really phenomenal. Uh, I also think we uh, owe uh, uh, or need to thank the SDS itself. Um, one of the uh, things you'll see as we go through uh, my little series of slides and talk to Jennifer is the uh, mm -hmm the illustrations have all been done by one uh, company so that they're very uniform and they're really superb. So uh, I think uh, Jake mentioned that a lot of surgeons uh, are visual learners. 
and to be able to look at the uh, a, a beautiful illustration of how an operation is intended to be performed just before you go into the operating room, you know, on your iPhone or iPad is really something that I think will be good for our patients. Um, so let me start by saying, I think uh, as uh, uh, Jeff uh, Jacobs pointed out, this is really probably the, the meat of the uh, book. And this is what people are really going to be interested in, I think, is, you know, before you go in to do an operation, you can uh, look at this chapter. Uh, and you can see here listed a partial uh, index of the different chapters that are, are in the book. And uh, why don't we go to the next slide, Jeff? So the other part of the uh, uh, book that I think is very important and interesting, and it, it makes it easier to navigate. And again, I think some of this, uh, I think came from Jeff when he took over as kind of the senior editor was that each lesion or each chapter uh, has the same format. So embryology, anatomy, nomenclature, pathophysiology, clinical presentation, diagnosis, indications, operative techniques, and then outcomes and complications. So if you are uh, 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 interested in a certain uh, part of this, uh, so you're presented with a, a patient with a core triatriatum and you want to know what the diagnostic techniques are, you just go to diagnosis under that chapter. If you're going into the operating room, you go to the operative techniques. Um, and then if you uh, you know, are, are worried about a certain complication and how to deal with it. Again, there's a section on that. So you can find that uh, within each of the different chapters. And again, it's very uh, standardized, which I think was a really uh, useful uh, 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 instruction for all of the authors at the very beginning of the formation of this book. Next. And so Dr. Uh, Romano is going to ask me some questions and I'll see if I can handle them. She's uh, Carl and I tough. decided we decided to do this a little differently and just kind of back and forth as we've moved along. And I would say being a contributor for this book was really exciting because again, it's such a novel platform and knowing that what you're writing today, you can continually update it. Having worked on the ICU chapter, obviously there's so many changes occurring on a regular basis. It was really great to know that it's going to be a living chapter that will really provide a great educational opportunity for anybody who interacts with it. But you know, Carl, when I look at this book, it's incredibly comprehensive. And I'm just wondering, is there really any element of cardiac heart disease care that hasn't been included in this book? Well, um, if there is, I couldn't find it. Um, actually, actually uh, the, the, um, the book is not completely finished. So, uh, and Jeff, you probably have the exact number of chapters that are still pending, but uh, and maybe uh, you can answer that as soon as I finish. But um, I do know that, for example, there's a fantastic chapter on congenitally corrected transposition that Victor Haraska wrote. Um, this chapter took a long time to do the illustrations because they're so complex. But uh, I just I just uh, finalized uh, going through that chapter this week, so that'll be coming out. So if there are uh, uh, lesions that you don't see in the index, that means that they probably are, uh, are are coming because I don't think there's anything that we haven't covered. Jeff, do you want to tell uh, yeah. people how many? Yes, um, so the, the the textbook is planned to have a total of 51 chapters. As of this moment, 36 of those chapters have been published online and are available. There's 15 chapters that remain and we anticipate the majority of those 15 chapters will be published uh, before the new year. I have to say, you know, if the chapters are delayed, to get the illustrations. And as you mentioned before, the fact that they're all done by the same illustrator is so important. And they really have done a beautiful job, especially with congenital heart defects, really trying to understand in a 2D image, a 3D heart defect can be really challenging. I think they've done a beautiful job. You know, Jenna, you're, you're absolutely right. And in fact, um, that's where we are with most of the remaining chapters is just finalizing the illustrations so that they'll all be drawn by the same artist. And then many of the chapters also have videos embedded in them showing this surgical technique as well. And that's the final details that are being worked out on the remaining 15 chapters. And like I said, most of those will be posted before the new year. So um, I was invited to write the uh, chapter on congenital problems of the trachea. And uh, I think you can see here just by looking at the, uh, uh, the little sidebar there that uh, we talk about diagnosis, natural history, the history uh, of surgery for tracheal surgery. 
And then within the um, operative techniques, you have tracheal resection, slide tracheal plasty, slide tracheoplasty, pericardial patch, tracheoplasty, tracheal homograph, uh, the unique patients with only one lung, future directions, and then references. So uh, you can go directly to any one of those uh, sections and immediately find what you're looking for. But uh, the, this is an example of really the beautiful uh, quality of the uh, the illustrations and the photographs. So on the on the left panel, you see a CT scan of a patient with a distal tracheal stenosis and a tracheal right upper lobe. On the right uh, side, you see a, 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 a um, specimen of trachea that I resected from a patient with complete tracheal rings. And one of the things you can do with that is you can, um, on your phone or on, on, on the iPad, you can mag those things up so that you can really see detail uh, even uh, more than what you see here on the screen. Uh, so again, the, uh, the audiovisual uh, component of this ebook is not to be underestimated. You know, a standard textbook, you can't take your fingers and swipe and make the thing bigger so that you can really see it. So, you know, the fact that Carl wrote this chapter is really kind of a world-renowned expert in vascular rings and associated tracheal issues. Um, aside from you being the author as being probably the greatest asset for this chapter, what else do you think is really outstanding? Example in this chapter is similar with the other chapters in terms of helping people understand these lesions and the surgical management. Well, one of the things we they did do is try to mix this up a little bit. So actually, the, uh, I wrote the chapter on the trachea, but Roosevelt Bryant wrote the chapter on vascular rings, and it was interesting because I was editing it. And I actually learned a few things from Roosevelt that I hadn't known. So um, I think there is some uh, opportunities for, uh, for the, in this book that we had some authors that uh, previously perhaps had not written uh, uh, textbooks or invited to write them to do them. And you get a little fresh insight into that particular lesion. Um, but I think the greatest asset of this, of these, of this uh, book is that essentially, um, you know, there's unlimited space. So all of the, like, for example, for the uh, tracheal surgery, we have illustrations of how to do all the different tracheal operations. Same thing with the vascular ring chapter. Uh, and that includes uh, very unusual cases that, you know, some, you know, normally when you write a, a textbook, you only, you, you're thinking about the pages and, you know, how much detail are we going to go into. But again, with uh, uh, this is all, uh, I think Jeff Jacobs was the one that, you know, said this when we did the nomenclature and database, we have unlimited, you know, space so that you can find uh, so much, uh, so many different uh, operations and unusual cases. Uh, the other uh, thing that I really like is the, the ability to connect to the links. So if, you, if you're reading a, 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 a chapter on, uh, uh, or reading about tracheal surgery, and you want to look at Hermes, Hermie Grillo's initial uh, paper on slide tracheoplasty and how Dr. Grillo did it, you can click on that link and you are taken to the internet and you can open up that, uh, that chapter and see that, um, uh, see exactly how Dr. Grillo did the operation, uh, you know, within the chapter on how Dr. Backer said you should do the operation. Um, this slide, this I picked out just as an example. This is from Dr. Quintessenza's uh, 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 chapter on transposition with intact ventricular septum. And here you can see every single step of an arterial switch operation. And again, uh, you can mag this up so you can really look at it in great detail. And, you know, you can see the, even down in the lower corner there how uh, he starts his suturing technique for the coronary artery buttons. So uh, uh, these illustrations are really remarkable. They're in color. You can mag them up. Uh, this is going to be really helpful, I think, for the surgeon going into the operating room. Next slide, Jeff. Yeah, and, and this, this chapter, not only does it have these great illustrations, but it also has some beautiful videos of the operation as well that are hyperlinked to the chapter. Correct. I forgot that. So, I mean, that's the exact point I was about to make, though, is that, I mean, this is a tremendous benefit for trainees preparing for some of these complex cases. Again, to your point, in many textbooks where there may be, you know, four images dedicated to an arterial switch operation. And, you know, now you can have videos and all these beautiful images. You know, you led a great training program for an extended period of time. How would you imagine using this for trainees going forward? Well, I think, uh, first of all, as uh, 
you know, uh, Jake mentioned, uh, you know, you can use this anywhere. I mean, you have it, you know, it's on your visual display. It's on your iPhone. I mean, you can, everybody has their iPhone with them 24 seven. So if you're, uh, you know, sitting, you know, waiting for anesthesia to put the patient to sleep, or you're, you know, harvesting a heart and you're on an airplane, or you're um, uh, driving somewhere, you know, and you're not driving, uh, you can, you can, be learning about congenital heart surgery. So I think it it uh, opens up the opportunity for us to use uh, more uh, a better use of our time. And the thing is there sitting for us, always available. So uh, I, I think that it's going to be a great uh, thing. I mean, I think every congenital heart surgeon in training is going to should have this ebook there. If they don't uh, have it, their uh, I mean their their residency program should provide it for them. Yeah, it's just going to make that point with the institutional memberships. I mean, that's been the challenge in the past of who, which textbook is are your, your, your trainees referencing, and it may be different from yours. Or it may be a different edition. Whereas with an institutional membership, where you know you're all using the same text, the same point for images, to say, hey, we're going to do X, Y, or Z tomorrow. I want you to take a look at this chapter in the ebook, and you know it's accessible to them. And if they get stuck in the hospital, they can't get home to their textbook. Like you said, it's accessible to them. It's on their iPhone. It's on their iPad. They can get it on their desktop. Um, and that's for even you know the visiting student who's on your service that you can give them access. Or you know the resident that's come over from the adult side who's on your service that doesn't want to buy a congenital textbook. They still have access to all this great information. And then this is just uh, one that I picked out, you know, aortopulmonary window is an unusual uh, diagnosis. We don't see it very often, but even more unusual is aortopulmonary window with an aortic arch interruption. But here it is, uh, there's the illustration of how to, uh, how to manage that patient. Um, so, you know, you can find really uh, comprehensive illustrations of very unique, unusual cases. Yeah, and these pictures also demonstrate the advantages of having a core group of artists illustrate all of the chapters because there's a conformity, conformity and standards between each chapter on the way the illustrations play out. Well, and I, I thought, you know, that last chapter was great. The last image was great because then you imagine in the OR where you have your surge tech, circulator perfusionist, anesthesia resident, people at all different levels with all levels of interest we're all participating in these complex cases. And to be able to say, again, with an institutional membership, take a look at this chapter and they can scroll simply down and just look at the operative image if they're interested in it, look at what are some of the physiologies for these patients very easily so they can be focused and it can be the 30,000 foot view for somebody who's assisting in the OR or for your trainee to click on those hyperlinks and go into the articles and get further information and really get an in-depth knowledge. So have you started using this for your cardiac team? Well, in fact, we just used it today. We had a uh, aortic arch advancement this morning, uh, and uh, I took the uh, uh, screenshot from the uh, ebook and we uh, put it on our pre-brief, which we sent to the, you know, that goes to the anesthesiologists, the OR nurses, uh, you know, the ICU people, so everyone could see exactly what, what operation we were going to do. And it was very helpful. I mean, it really, it really helps. I really think it helps the OR nurses. Uh, I think it helps the ICU team. Uh, it really puts everyone on the same page. So I, I, I think it's a, it's, it's fantastic. The other thing is we showed the pictures to the, to the parents uh, uh, so that they understood, you know, what operation their child was going to have. So this is going to be, it's going to be a great asset for, for a lot of different reasons. Yeah, I've even uh, slaved it to the monitors in the OR. You can just pull it up live on the monitors and get whatever page you want, and it's amazing. Jennifer, as usual, you're one step ahead of the rest of us. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Carl and Jenna, for taking us through the section of the textbook that has all of the chapters about the different operations that we do as pediatric and congenital cardiac surgeons. But we'll now pro progress to the uh, third and final section of the STS ebook congenital section, which is entitled Professionalism in Pediatric and Congenital Cardiac Care. This section has four chapters, and although small, these chapters are quite important. And information about this section will be shared with us by John Meyer and Earl Austin. Uh, 
both of whom need no introduction. John is a senior associate in cardiac surgery at Boston Children's Hospital and a professor of surgery at Harvard Medical School. He's also a past president of the Society of Thoracic Surgeons, and he's going to present this section and have a dialogue with Earl Austin, who's a professor of surgery emer emeritus in the Department of Cardiovascular and Thoracic Surgery and past chair at University of Louisville. And Earl is also a past president of the Congenital Heart Surgeon Society. So with this introduction, I'll turn it over to John Meyer. Thank you. Uh, it's uh, great to see this uh, textbook uh, that Bill Baumgartner and I started on the cardiac side several years ago, get to this uh, almost done uh, state. I think we've hit on several of the advantages of uh, this approach, uh, not the least of which is the updating. Uh, it can happen quite quickly by the chapter authors so without having to rewrite or republish an entire book. Uh, as well as all the opportunities for links, both video and otherwise, uh, to uh, an initial references. So uh, we'll talk at the end about one other feature that uh, we've added uh, to this um, to this ebook uh, that I think will even further enhance it. But what I'm going to talk about just very briefly here is the last section in the book, but one might argue uh, that uh, this is the most important. So Earl, why don't you start us off? Uh, thanks, John, and I appreciate being involved here. Um, obviously, it's a, it's a pleasure doing this with John, who I've known for, uh, for many years. And in addition to, the, to so many of his contributions to this, this uh, electronic format, He's contributed to the anatomy, physiology, and so more, so many other things. But John is also a humanist. And I think one of the strengths of this ebook is the fact that there is a, a whole section that um, is related to professionalism, which basically refers to the humanistic part that we provide as physicians, surgeons, as caretakers of patients and, and the fact that we have to deal with uh, little patients and larger patients. And um, a lot has to go into ethical aspects of uh, the fact that we actually um, go in in a relatively high stakes situation with a child or an older person with congenital heart disease. And there are clearly ethical aspects of it. And I think you will enjoy uh, reading John's chapter, um, which basically is the first of several chapters related to, uh, to professionalism. And I thought we'd start with, uh, why should a surgeon be concerned about ethics, John? Well, uh, first of all, um, Jeff, you wanna advance one, please? Uh, you know, there are unique aspects about providing surgical care, which is different than many other forms of medical care, because we're actually invading a patient's body. Uh, and in some interpretations, we are actually harming them in order to heal them. And if we did this in any other setting other than the practice of surgery, uh, that would be uh, illegal, uh, uh, to say the least. Other aspect of this that is not commonly thought about is that once patients are in a surgical setting, particularly under anesthesia, uh, they can't defend themselves and they're essentially uh, surrendering all ability to make choices to the surgeon. So, so John, obviously the ethics is a big part and I think uh, that helps us sort of understand how important it is for us to take that into account. But professionalism covers a lot of areas. And um, can you uh, kind of uh, go into some of the others? Well, I, one of the things that I spent some time talking about in the chapter is this uh, notion of uh, our role uh, as a leadership role, as opposed to just somebody who makes an incision and you know, stops the bleeding and fixes something. 
Uh, and I think this is an important uh, reference. I, I would encourage uh, everyone to read it. Uh, it's this notion about uh, understanding the difference between leadership and authority uh, as defined by this uh, member of the Harvard faculty over at the Kennedy School named Ron Heifetz, uh, who actually is the son of a neurosurgeon. All of us may have remembered at some point in our training Heifetz clips. Uh, the, that was Dr. Heifetz's uh, dad. But in any event, uh, this just gives you an idea and without going into all the details of this, just takes a little time to explain, but the kind of uh, things that I think are important to consider uh, in uh, our uh, interactions with families uh, and in fact, leading them uh, as Heifetz uh, describes into facing, you know, what really are quite difficult uh, decisions about going ahead with surgery or not, uh, you know, what approach to take uh, involves uh, not uh, the typical, you know, I've got the uh, stars on my shoulders, follow me leadership, but rather, you know, a different uh, notion. But this is the kind of thing that, um, you know, we try to uh, uh, deal with, or I have tried to deal with in this approach to the patients and families uh, section in this uh, professionalism area. So, so John, the uh, all of us who are in this field, and I think it's true for most all other fields in medicine, and particularly surgical ones, um, we sort of have to connect with the families, and and you've already indicated that you don't want to come on as primarily an authority. You actually want to have a way to, to carefully communicate with them to explain. Um, what to anticipate, the risk involved. And um, I know I learned some from you when I was a fellow um, at Boston Children's, just watching you and I've tried to learn from that. I wonder if you might share with us your approach to uh, patients who, patients or their, their child that uh, has to undergo a, uh, an operation. So uh, uh, we spend a fair amount of time in this uh, chapter on the approach to patients and families talking about informed consent. Uh, and um, I would just point out a few highlights from that. Uh, first of all, uh, most uh, studies that have looked at informed consent uh, show that patients or families do not remember much of what their surgeons tell them during the informed consent process. Uh, and uh, as part of my approach, uh, what I have uh, tried to do is to uh, explain that medicine and probably all of biology, but particularly surgery is an odds game, uh, which has risk. Uh, and that, you know, my responsibility as an operating surgeon is to recommend a treatment approach that gives the best odds and the least risk uh, for every patient, uh, considering all the alternative ways of treating it. Uh, this brings up obviously difficult uh, subjects, uh, particularly question of survival or other adverse outcomes. But I think it has provided a rational basis for families to uh, proceed with decision-making uh, and even if things don't go well uh, and the patient doesn't survive or has a bad outcome, at least the patients are left with a rational basis for having embarked on this uh, course of treatment uh, for their child. Uh, and it's true also for the adolescent and young adult patients that we uh, operate. Uh, one of the other references in the chapter is about... Uh, what Dr. McNeely, Martin McNeely, uh, has uh, uh, characterized as the entrustment process. And so the informed consent process is not just about getting somebody to sign a document so you could use it if you had uh, got, gotten sued or something like that uh, in court, uh, but it actually can be a mechanism by which uh, the human side of the surgeon is actually demonstrated along with their 
competence and knowledge of the given disease process. Uh, and a subsequent side benefit is uh, it also allows a surgeon to live with himself uh, because he knows he has pursued this course uh, with, um, uh, with a good rational basis, uh, even if the operation hasn't turned out exactly as intended. So the final few thoughts are, are ones that uh, are cited just to solidify many of these concepts, not the least of which is the notion the, or this quote from Einstein, uh, who uh, indicated that whoever's careless with the truth cannot be trusted with important matters. So again, makes it uh, quite important that we are rational and truthful in all things that we do. And probably the better quote is this, to be trusted is a greater compliment than being loved. John, let me um, just interrupt for, for this particular part. You've already referred to something that this ebook has that um, other already printed textbooks have is the actually ability to comment um, on a basically something that's already been written. I think one of the other chapters in this section is from Gus Mavrudis and Constantine and Catherine Mavrudis and several others um, that actually talk about ethics. And interestingly, after you read that, you felt that there would be um, a value to um, add a comment. So, um, and, and, and in fact, I think you have it um, or at least a, a portion of your comment there, but it's, uh, I wonder if you would uh, say something uh, about both the process of adding your comment and as well as maybe some of your, the, the thoughts in your comment. Well, um, I think uh, this is, as I said, one of the more attractive aspects of having an electronic uh, format for publishing uh, because we can easily incorporate these comments and Many of the things that I alluded to in the previous section uh, were things that I thought were worth uh, talking about in the context of uh, Dr. Mavrudis's chapter, um, you know, on uh, ethics uh, uh, specifically. Uh, but I think the important part here is that uh, you know we have this ability uh, and welcome, uh, you know, commentary. Uh, on a given chapter, whether it's, gee, I don't do the operation that way, I do it this way, or, uh, and here's why, uh, or whether it's something more, um, you know, uh, theoretical and uh, maybe a slightly more nebulous, which is be commenting on a chapter on ethics. So uh, I think, um, you know, this is one of the great um, features of publishing in the electronic format certainly was one of the uh, aspects of the book uh, as originally conceived uh, and why we really thought that uh, this, this would be a major contribution and not just another textbook. Yeah, I would echo that, uh, John. I think that the ability for any of the readers to write a commentary on the chapter, send it in to the editorial board, have it reviewed by the editorial board, and potentially after editorial board editing and approval, have it added to the chapter as a commentary, makes this more of a living and breathing document than the big thick textbooks that are currently sitting on the shelves in our offices. And I, I think that's that and the instant accessibility from the phone at any time are two of the greatest features of this book. Jeff, it strikes me it's also value, um, you know, because typically we're always waiting for the next edition with, you know, each edition, usually by the time it's written and every been reviewed by editors and so forth. And I'm talking about the, the you know, the books we have on our shelves um, that you're waiting for the next one. Well, actually, this is a, this is kind of a living document. And as new information comes along, the authors, as well as others have the opportunity to keep it up to date. Yeah, and I think the other feature, you know, there is this, uh, you know, as part of each chapter, uh, there is a feedback button, uh, literally, uh, as you're uh, reading through the chapter, if you have thoughts, you know, you can provide direct feedback that will go back to the author. Uh, and certainly, that's one mechanism by which one could 
uh, even perhaps offer a more extended commentary. Yeah, that, that's absolutely correct, John. There's the opportunity to develop and write extended commentaries with the goal of having them added to the book. And then there's the feedback button that allows one to have maybe a shorter piece of feedback or a longer piece of feedback, not designed to be part of the book necessarily, but to go back to the authors and the editorial team. And, and both of these features are available. Well, um, I, I'd like to thank John and Earl for presenting this third part of the book. And I'd like to thank all of our presenters for discussing why we, why we believe that this textbook allows for and facilitates a transformed methodology of pediatric and congenital cardiac education. Uh, we, in the last nine minutes that we have on this webinar, I'd first like to ask all of the panelists to come back on the screen uh, and they'll put us on in a Brady Bunch view. While that's happening, I'd like to acknowledge our entire STS educational team. Uh, this is a team that includes uh, Scott Bradbury, who's the Vice President of Education for the Society of Thoracic Surgeons, and the remainder of the education team, Karen Kostrinsky, Amanda Wright, and uh, Melissa Puthin Maiden. Uh, these three uh, individuals under the leadership of Scott, so these four individuals, have been phenomenal and phenomenal in putting not only this STS congenital and pediatric cardiac section of the book together, but the entire ebook together. Uh, they devoted uh, hundreds and hundreds of hours to making this happen. They've had weekly phone calls with the group of people on this Zoom uh, for over a year and a half now and done the same activities for general thoracic and adult cardiac. So uh, I would like to thank uh, all four of these individuals for their tremendous support of this book and of the Society of Thoracic Surgeons. And I'd like to briefly turn it over to our STS team so they can talk a little bit about uh, how one might access this book. Thank you so much, Dr. Jacobs and the wonderful panel. The STS Cardiothoracic Surgery eBook is now available for purchase. It is available online or mobile. It's the most complete and authoritative resource for CT surgical information in the world. The latest update on the ebook includes 36 new chapters in the adult and pediatric cardiac surgery volume. You can learn more about it and subscribe at sts.org slash ebook. An institutional subscription allows you to share current and consistently updated information with the entire CT surgery team and save money for your organization. For more information, please contact sales at unboundmedicine.com. We invite you to become a member of STS if you're not one already. You'll enjoy a variety of discounts, benefits, and opportunities to help you grow professionally Learn more at sts.org slash membership. And guess what? The STS annual meeting is the preeminent event in cardiothoracic surgery, allowing more translational science and hands-on activities than any other educational event of its kind. Please join thousands of CT surgery colleagues in Miami Beach, Florida on January 29th to 31st. Registration will open next month and register by December 2nd for early bird rate. Lastly, save the date for the next event in the STS webinar series. The program will address surgeons and comprehensive biomarker testing for lung cancer patients. We really appreciate everybody who presented today and especially Dr. Jacob. Thank you so much for participating in our webinar series. And, and again, uh, thank you, Karen, and to the entire STS team. Thank you for the panelists. And um, I've, I've enjoyed listening to everybody's viewpoints on the feature uh, that we have in our STS ebook. This has been a very enjoyable hour. And uh, I hope everybody has a wonderful evening. And thanks for sharing this time with us.